So at that point, you're 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 a, now a playwright and you're a working professional director producer, doing commercial projects and also uh, being able to exercise your creative muscle in some ways. Um, at what point do you do you connect with El Teatro Campesino and begin to write Soldier Boy? Well, um, I was invited to be the line producer of a film called Seguin, which was an American Playhouse project. Um, that was a really good experience. You know, when the moment I I finished that, I mean, our budget was like four hundred thousand dollars for an hour and a half movie. And again, it was because I knew, and I, 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 I talked to the director, who was also the producer, to not shoot 35 millimeter, to shoot in 16, because that would save us at least $50,000. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, and uh, you know, I knew, since I knew SAG contracts, I, I worked on a budget and I worked on a schedule for the guy so that uh, I got him in and out of Texas in, in, in one piece. <laughs> and the film, you know, it is. It was what it was. I mean, it was not a great script, but, uh, but, you know, it did go on national television. Uh, my wife and I were thinking about what we'd like to do next, and uh, I wanted, you know, I wanted to do Soldier Boy. Well, I guess I should ask you, when did you meet your wife, and how, and how did y'all meet? Well, we met in college. Oh, okay. And it wasn't until I got back to L.A. that I realized that she was. She had, you know, she was my high school, my college sweetheart, mm. uh, and then you know, time passes. You, you know, I go in the navy, and you know, not, most of us don't have to be in the navy. Mm. Uh, so, uh, I guess maybe it was five years later, or maybe seven years later, that uh, I find myself in L.A. and uh, uh, had with nothing to do, and I realized her father was still living in San Antonio. Her father had moved to Los Angeles and I checked the phone book and there was his name. I called him and he said, oh, you got to come over. Come on over. So I did and there was Judy sitting on the porch on the, in the living room. So uh, we immediately reconnected. The chemistry was still there. We really fell in love again and uh, uh, married soon thereafter. And she she was an artist too, a writer. No, she was uh, she was a school teacher at the time. Her degree was in anthropology, but uh, but you know, but she and she would have been a great anthropologist. But the problem was that no department really wanted, you know, another woman anthropologist. That mm. was very sexist at the time in mm. terms of, and she also wanted to do field work and those kinds of things. And mm. well, so she uh, she found out that there was an opportunity. To, uh, to become a school teacher, and there was only going to be one slot open, mm. and there was about 40 or 50 people taking the test for that one slot. Mm. She came out the top. Mm. She, you know, she got the job. Wow. And uh, um, so, you know, at the time she's being an elementary school teacher, and I'm, you know, I'm running a small production company doing, you know, medical, scientific films, whatever, as I said, whatever came in the door. Um, uh, you, said, you said that you guys decided, like together you decided to Well, I wanted to do this this play, okay. but felt unsure and so uh, about doing it just myself. So we wrote it together. Um, uh, she would take one chapter and I'd take another chapter, I mean, not chapter, but another scene and scene by scene and then we worked together at polishing the scenes together. And uh, uh, I need to back up a little bit because what happened was that during the time that I was doing all of these things, um, I also saw a play called Zoot Suit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was a perfect project for television, for, for a film. Can I, where did you see that you saw it in LA? In LA at the, at the Mark Taper Forum. Mark Taper, okay. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I had met Luis, but just briefly, Luis Valdez. And uh, um, I had been, you know, after Seguin, I was meeting with people at different places, uh, different studios. I, I was, had a, a kind of a deal with some people at Universal Studios. 
I, Ned Tannen was the president of the studio at the time. I walked in and said, you know, the project you should be making is Zoot Suit. And he said, well, if you can bring it in, we'll do it. Well, I did all the research and found out that, you know, Reese Valdez had been approached by Ray Stork, who was a big agent at the time, and he thought it would be a great project for John Travolta. To play the main <laughs> to be the, the, the main, main the, the main the character Henry Reyna. Uh huh. Uh, well, Luis didn't map, particularly map, warm up map, to the idea, map, map, <laughs> so that that project died. Map, map. And basically, you know, they'd offered him a lot of money for it, and he turned it down. Mm. So, I I found out all the backstories where the project had failed here and there, and then approached Luis and said, you know, what if I can put a deal together where you get to direct and, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's going to have to be low budget, $2 million. And he said, I'll do it. So I go back to Ned Tannen and I say, if we can do this for $2 million and he directs, we've got a deal. And then Tannen thought about it for a day and called me next day and said, well, pull it all together. Hmm. And uh, I did. Um, and learned some harsh lessons in the process. And by not having an agent myself, hmm. I then, you know, was offered an associate producer position rather than a producer position, hmm. which I would have worked for free for a producer position. Well, can I just briefly, you know, for those of us not in the know, when we see, you know, the credits on a movie producer. We, we, I don't know what is a what is a producer. I, I, I thought it was somebody who just kind of pulls together people and gets things going and completes it. What is a producer in that sense? Well, a producer is somebody who will put the package together. I mean, put the actors together, a budget together, a crew together. You know, walk in and say, "This is what we can do." Mm. Uh, it's like maybe a contractor. Mm. Okay. You know, yeah. general contractor. Okay. Okay. So. Um, and you know the, the the thing is that in Hollywood everything is controlled by agents, mm -hmm. and they have their own special people. So it's like if if you want Robert Redford for a project, maybe you should give this guy over here a chance to be a director. Uh huh. Okay, that's how it works. That's how it works. It's give and take, you know. And uh, these guys are very powerful. They may be extremely experienced at it. You know, they didn't become agents overnight. They, you know, they worked their way up through, through the, through, from the mail room. So they own, they know where the bodies are buried. They know who owes, who owes what, what, uh, uh, who has debts and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, those, you know. So did your, your, in, so they offer you an associate producer. So what does that mean? That means that you, what, you're not going to make or you're not going to make the money. Maybe. Well, I'm not, not going to be one of the pe principal people in in the in the process. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Mark Taper people had all you know. They they were just these giant egos. I mean, mm. we're the ones that can put the project together. And mm. You're a nobody, and really, I was a nobody. Mm. I was really more bluff than, than anything else. So uh, I told him no. <laughs> like you, 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 more bluff. You just you got you got to say it like you mean it. You, I mean it's part calm, but and then you back it up on the back end. You make yeah. it happy, but well, you got to just talk. Yeah, but it's it's you know, you walk in, you tell him I'm going to do this. You know, and I'm gonna, it's going to be fantastic. You feel like what's the thing like Donald Trump talking right. about the oh you're going to love it. Yeah. It's going to be so wonderful. Mm. But at the back end, you have to actually do it. Mm. And uh, that's the part I really loved. Just getting to that part, for me, that's, that's the, once they gave me the go-ahead, I was, I was there. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately, that's what does most young filmmakers in, is that mm -hmm. yes, they can, you know, they can walk in and talk a good show, mm -hmm. but when it comes to actually doing it, mm -hmm. they don't have the experience, or they don't have the courage, or something happens, mm -hmm. and, and they falter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so can I ask the, the the film that most of us know, Zoot Suit, that 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 you know, with Danny Valdez and Edward James, almost that we all know, was that made through what was his name, Tanneman, through that his company, through Universal Studios. So, so that the reason why it got made through Universal, or part of the reason, is because of your That's role how you put in it that. together. You put it together. So this is for our listeners. This is 
uh, this is some historical evidence right here, you know, and Chicano history for all of the, the lovers of, you know, Luis Valdez and all of his great work and Severo, but this is some real interesting history. Well, and basically that was my entree to Luis Valdez. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my wife and I wrote the script. It was going to be, a, it was a feature, it was a feature film script. Mm -hmm. um, Luis, uh, uh, I sent it to Luis through uh, his his associate, uh, Phil Esparza, who's like his uh, consigliere, uh, uh, you know, produ uh, back, you know, guy that takes care of his back, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and like that. And uh, it took Luis about three months to finally get back to me, and and uh, uh, he said, I want to do it as a play, not as a film, as a play. And so, so I want to invite you to my, to my theater uh, to be a playwright in residence and you're going to write the play here mm. and that was probably one of the really profound experiences in my life to work with somebody like Luis Valdez mm. at developing that play I mean it's like a master's degree in playwriting in structure in storytelling mm. um, uh, I mean I had another experience like that with Carmen Zapata I had another experience like that with uh, Alfonso Guarao, who did like Water for Chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, I mean, and I had some experience already, besides the fact that I'd taken acting classes and constantly preparing myself. So these were, these were like, this, these were my, my teachers for my doctorate in, in mm -hmm. filmmaking. Right. Um, plus, the other, you know, other people that I worked with, uh, uh, David Miller, who was the the director of Executive Action, the, fin the film that I worked on, uh, doing locations. I mean, I was his driver. I was with him every day. Um, you know, I was running to the lab with him to look at the dailies. Uh, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, he'd also had done one of the films that I loved as a child, Flying Tigers with John Wayne. Uh -huh. so. But when you were a child and you watched that movie, why did you love? Was it just the action and the drama? Well, or? it was because of the zeitgeist of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, there was uh, there was this kind of patriotism that mm -hmm. existed, mm -hmm. and my, since my father had been part of the Second World War, I wanted to somehow vicariously experience some of it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite film of that time, it still remains one of my favorite film of that time, is a mm -hmm. film called Battleground directed and written by Robert Peroche, who was actually a veteran, you know, so it was like the real, you got the feeling that there was a, a real quality of, of verisimilitude in the, in the, uh, in the film. Mm. Anyway, so Luis Valdez, uh, I spent, uh, uh, I think, about eight months up there in his theater working on the play. Uh, at the same time, you know, I, they put me to work doing all kinds of other things. I did a slideshow for the local state park. I, I did still photograph some of them. I did copy stand work for them. Anything that they, anything photographic that they needed done, I was the guy for, you know, during that time I was there. Mm. Um, the play went on in November of 1982, uh, and uh, it was a tremendous success. I mean. They sold out immediately, and every every performance was was really powerful. Hmm. How, what does it feel like for you to to have this, you know, profound? Maybe as a child, I don't know how aware you were, but have a, this profound experience of, of you know waiting for your dad to come home, and then you know some thirty, forty years later, um, writing this piece based on that, and then having it really like produced to the level to where people really get to experience your story and to, 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 to positive renown. Like how, how does, how did that feel for you at the time? Well, I had to, you know, you know, I was, I was no longer a child. Uh, uh, I, I don't really recall, uh, a whole lot about the war because I was too young. Um, uh, the day my father came home, I remember, sitting being woken up like at two in the morning you know it was probably only 10 o'clock but it seemed like it was some god-awful hour yeah. and just sitting in bed and looking at this man that comes in the door mm. you know and i had a vague memory of him he'd been gone for three years mm. and uh in the meantime i had bonded with his brother mm. uh, willie who was very frail 
and uh, um, Willie was within months, I think, of my father's return. Willie died, mm. and so in the inter intervening years, I had a chance to think about my father and who he was, because he was an incredibly sensitive man, mm. an incredibly subtle, incredibly intelligent. Um, uh, I mean. My father could have been a surgeon, he could have been, you know, a scientist, he could have been anything he wanted, but because of the circumstances of where he was born, at the time he was born, um, you know, he, he, he was what he was, and uh, again, he had an enormous dignity, and, you know, and all his life he had an ethical standard which I feel like informed me and in my life. About how to treat people and, and how to have respect. Um, he uh, so the story came to me is that what happens to a man who returns from one of the most brutal wars and one of the most you know, one of the companies that had suffered the most in terms of casualties because you've heard maybe you've heard of the men of Company E the. Company E, the Texas National Guard unit that mm -hmm. went up there and was basically decimated mm -hmm. in Italy. Mm -hmm. Well, he was part of that group. Mm -hmm. So out of the out of his company, you know, he he was you know uh, he was one of the handful of men to actually survive the war. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not all of them died. Many of them were just wounded to the point where they really couldn't continue and were shipped back. But he was one of the people who, who did, and uh, and he had this incredible uh, kind of personal strength about him that he didn't allow being a Mexican, a Mexican American, to stand in his way of success. I mean, he was going to be the leader of his company. He was going to be the guy that was in charge, and he did. People immediately respected him for it. He was tough. He was fair, and uh, he took care of the younger soldiers that came in because once, once after they got out of Italy, I mean, most of the, most of the Chicanos had been, I mean, either been wounded or dead. Mm. So they started replacing them with people from Mississippi and places like that. He would write letters for them because these guys were illiterate. Mm. So uh, he he engendered a lot of respect from his from the men around him. And something that he had the rest of his life, no matter where he went, people mm -hmm. had this trust and respect for his integrity. Um, that probably had a lot to do with shaping me as well. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so but the story to me that of Soldier Boy was balancing what happens to a man with tender sensibilities, mm -hmm. who has to who, who has gone through that that fierce war, mm. and then comes home. Mm. Uh, I mean, was there P P uh, PTSD? Mm. Was there that? Quite likely. Uh, he had a, for a while he had a flash temper. He would just, he would blow up. And, uh, and because my mother, she, she, would, she knew how to deal with him and keep him calm. He never was violent, mm. but he would just, be fierce. Mm. Uh, so, what happens to a man who then comes home and finds that his brother has become the surrogate father mm. of his son? And you know, it becomes fictional in this part because then you know, real life doesn't have cre dramatic arcs. You have to you have to create them for fiction. Right. But uh, but he was uh, uh, so that's how the story evolved. Plus the fact is that throughout the years, he, he, little nuggets of things came out about his life in the service, and um, and those little nuggets just stayed in my mind, and I, I you know couldn't let them. I mean, they they became part of the play. Mm -hmm. um, Things like uh, the fact that he, he would say that whenever they were doing house-to-house -house fighting, he would take a rock and throw it into a building first. Mm. Why? Because if he heard children, he wouldn't throw a hand grenade in. Mm. 
Wow. Wow. Mm. Well, you, what can I ask you, would you consider Soldier Boy your, your, your kind of greatest creative work or do you look at it that way or? I no, mean, I don't look at it that way at all. I consider it, uh, I consider it my first play. Your first play, okay. Um, that, uh, that I did, that was, uh, that was appreciated by people, that people liked, uh, that moved people. I mean, one of the incredible things about that is that when you sit in the theater with Don Juan Bautista, mm. you could hear people sob mm. because of the power of the play. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, I then, you know, after that, I, I went through a series of of things that I, films that I that I was doing, I was becoming really successful as a filmmaker. Uh, companies wanted to hire me to do films for them, and I did. Um, uh, but I felt I wasn't doing anything personally creative, mm. and uh, there were basically all kinds of things, but not, um, you know, not anything I, you know. I, and again, I, I took every job as as a professional, trying to do the best I could. Uh, to you know, be a learning experience for me. Make something that the client could be happy with, mm. and and be the kind have something the client could be proud of. So they could show it to other people and say, "Look, look what I did." Right. right. Um, uh, but and the Earth did not swallow him. We kind of been had been the project that I wanted to produce from 1973. How did so? Can I ask about that? How did you become introduced to the work of Tomas Rivera and um, and and the Earth did not swallow him? That particular well, book. Of I this? mean, I've told the story many times, but basically, to do a short version of it is that 1973, I read, the, I, found, I bought the book. A couple of weeks, months later, I read it uh, in one sitting. I saw that Tomas was teaching at UTSA. I called him and and asked him. You know, I told him that I thought it was a wonderful book. That it was he had turned our story of our people into literature. And I consider it a really poetic, powerful book. Uh, a lot of people disagree with me, but I, I still see the power and beauty of it. Mostly because I've read it in Spanish rather than the English version. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, and for me, the, the, the language was the language of people I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the phrasing, the, 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 you know, the, the rhythm, the tempo, the rhythm, the flavor, all those things. All it's like this is written by somebody just down the road. Mm. You could feel it in your body when you read it. And, exactly. Yeah. It was that. It was uh, so. I told him that I wanted to make it into a film <laughs> in 1973. Of course, I was at the beginning of my career. I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, it became like the project I wanted to do. The project I wanted to do, and I pursued him. I pursued him. And uh, even took him to dinner several times when he was at Chancellor of UC Riverside, trying to convince him. To, and he's trying to convince me to go study, get a doctorate. Oh. <laughs> come, come to Riverside, get yourself a doctorate. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to do that. I want to make your book in, into a film. Did he know you? Did he know your work at all? He had. By that time, he had. Okay. Because I had done, I had worked on Seguin. I had worked on all kinds of other projects. In fact, you know, I met him in 1974 while I was production managing a shoot for McGraw Hill uh, broadcasting mm -hmm. so you know so he he knew who I was and the things I was doing and but his thing was that just oh just I, you don't need my permission just do it mm -hmm. well you can't raise money on just do it mm -hmm. you have to have a, a legal document that gives you an option to you know that means that you are the only person exclusively have the rights to be able to pursue this project mm -hmm. So then he dies. So he gives you this document. No, he no. never does. He no, never he does. Okay. Uh, so to make a long story short, I mean, I I finally a couple of years after struggling uh, with uh, you know with the fact that his wife had claimed that another person had the rights to it, mm. I finally uh, in 1986 got her to to give me a document that said I had permission. I gave her a check for $1,000. I had a two-year option. I renewed that option three times um, for $3,000. And uh, 
on that basis, I was able to raise the money to uh, and put the, a deal together that I presented to PBS and to the National Endowment of Humanities to raise the money and put together a superb panel of, of scholars that were historians and literature people. Mm. And uh, that's probably what I consider my, my, my work uh, that I really, but it was based, the work I did was based primarily on the fact that the American Playhouse did not want to do this film. Hmm. So I had to keep working mentally, hmm. you know, at polishing and polishing and polishing uh, the material to the point where they finally had to say yes, that they couldn't no longer say no to the project. Hmm. Plus the fact that I had, you know, I had already a, a, su a substantial amount of money from from na the National Endowment of Humanities hmm. uh, to be able to make the film. So how long between between the um, let's say you int you trying to persuade Tomas Rivera to let you make this movie to the point where you're actually uh, on location shooting? How many years? Well, from the 1973 to the moment it premiered in 1994, it was 21 years. Wow, that's commitment. <laughs> so I guess uh, I I I learned a term during that period, and it's called cathetic. To be cathetic about something means to be emotionally and psychologically invested in something. Mm. I was that. Mm. So, at, being that invested over twenty-one years, do you are there times where you kind of doubt your or doubt that it's going to be finished, or you say no, this is going to happen? Oh, I mean, I'm just gonna... For me, it was going to happen. It was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I was going to wait out the bastards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were not going to. They were not going to beat me. <laughs> As much as they tried to, to stall me, to beat me, to to shut me aside, uh, mm. you know, I was not going to be, I was not going to be defeated. Mm. So all of the hard work, the creative uh, rewriting of it, and getting getting the cast together, the money raised, and everything. Um, can I ask how? What was what was your budget for shooting? How? Where did you shoot? And how long did it take to shoot the film? Well. Uh, the budget that we went into production with was about a million one, one million one hundred thousand um, dollars. Uh, not all of that money was spent on the production because, you know, there the, there has to be an entity that actually controls. That was San Diego, San Diego State University, through the K, the, the public television station there, KPBS. Uh, so they took, like. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars off the top. So my budget then was more like nine hundred thousand dollars, mm -hmm. and uh, we went into production uh, on the basis of that. We had a twenty-seven day shoot. Um, uh, we were. We. I was hoping to shoot in in Texas and in Minnesota, but it would have taken another half million dollars to be able to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. We would to to fly the crew out to house the actors to do all those things. Mm. People have asked me, and, and it's, it's a good question, why didn't I hire local actors? Mm. Um, for the same reason, I wouldn't have hired a local director or, or anything like that. So I, wanted, I needed somebody that had a wealth of experience that is equal to, at least to mine mm. to be able to direct it. And, well, and I wasn't going to let anybody else direct it. Mm. <laughs> there was no way that was going to happen. But I also needed pe actors that have a commitment to acting, not just as a part-time job, mm. but as something they do every day. Mm. That, in fact, they are like highly trained musicians. Mm. I mean, they practice every day doing what they do. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I knew that I, I could count on them, not only to deliver their lines, but give me the emotional content without having to really work all that hard to get them there because they're already tuned in mm. to the material and are are keen. Uh, Rose Portillo, the actress who plays the mom, uh, Marco Rodriguez who plays the father, Lupe Ontiveros who plays the prostitute in the Midwest. Mm. These are all people that are just fine, you know, really finely trained actors, mm. and and you know don't need anything more than action.
Yeah, and it, well, in my humble opinion, it shows. I mean, the, in my opinion, the the movie is is a, a classic, and it will go on to be considered that only because, uh, well, not only, but it's it's just a wonderful movie, and it offers a glimpse inside of this this world that a lot of people don't think about and a lot of people don't know about, and it captures it so well. And the the drama of this family and the performances are so powerful. I mean, you can't help but be you just shed it, shed tears throughout the movie. Um, so. Can I ask you the final product of the film? You're you're very happy with it, or how do you feel when you when you think about it now? You see it now. Well, when I see it now, I'm 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 pleased. Uh, I only achieved about seventy percent of what I wanted to achieve. Mm. That thirty percent cost me a lot emotionally. Mm. That that thirty percent that I lost, not only because. When we were in tech, in California, you know, some of the days that we were shooting there it was 115 degrees, and uh, things move. You know, people move in, move in slow motion. I mean, mm. it's just mm -hmm. you know, you just can't hurry people. Mm. <laughs> it's like that mm. when it's that hot. I see. Um, when we got to the Midwest, to Minnesota, to shoot there, uh, uh, we were there for 11 days. It rained nine out of the 11 days we were there. Mm. So, you know, there's something called cover sets, something that you create in your budget that if it rains, you can move to a cover set. Right. You just have to excuse the, the ambient ambient uh, noise. We're, we're on location out, outside here at the uh, cottage where Severo is, is staying as artist in residence. So time is money. You lose time. People move slow. You lose money. Or... You go, to, you know. So in the in, when we're shooting, uh, the you know, we shot our cover sets like almost in the first three days. So and then I have to rewrite the script to uh, so that you know we we continue shooting, but we're shooting interiors instead of exteriors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in the process, I lost some of the scenes I wanted to shoot. The, the Christmas scene where the mother is accused of shoplifting, and the scene where they go to a, a little diner to, to uh, in order 54 hamburgers. Mm. <laughs> the guy looks out and this, doesn't see a truck or anybody, but these two guys showing up wanting 54 hamburgers. Um, scenes like that that I just didn't get to shoot. Uh, there were several others uh, that, that you know that that I felt would have informed and deepened the material. Mm. Um, so it was tough. Uh, but the, the thing is that I had, you know, every moment of the shoot, I had the crew behind me 100%. I had the actors behind me 100%. I had, uh, I had uh, you know, two wonderful editors to work with that, uh, that you know, really want to, to do it, a great job. And so, uh, you know, I was able to, to craft a film. And of course, the, the music was another wonderful experience, working with Marcos Loya, the, the composer, uh, who did a brilliant job uh, evoking the, the, the feel of the film. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, uh, all of uh, Severo's work can be found at his, his website is scriptpostscript.com. And, um, and I want to ask you, I just have a couple more questions. You know, in your, you've been the artist here in residence at the writer for the Center for the Southwest Writers. Um, and also your work and your archives have been, you've submitted them to the Whitliff Galleries. Yes. Can you tell me how that came about and what, well, what your intention is behind that? Well, the Whitliff asked. <laughs> uh, Steve Davis, who works at the Whitliff, said, would I be interested in donating my my archives to to the Whitliff? Um, I was a little surprised. I mean, for me, it was just a bunch of boxes in my garage. Mm. Uh, but it were the scripts for the the notes, the you know, all the material that it took to to uh, to uh, to tell the story, to make the, the to write the script for the film, and I was actually very proud that they, they would bother to ask. And, mm. and now I realize that uh, that that the Whitliff uh, and people like yourself actually consider this a very important project, and that the material needs to be available 
to people and so that not only do they know where the film exists but where there's notes telling people how I went about making it mm. yeah and the, my last question really is it's about you know I know you gave a talk the other night about you know a Chicano filmmaker and, and, and you, you and you told me that you're a filmmaker but that happens to be Chicano and um, people from my generation you know I'm about 40 now we kind of look back to you know your generation and you know when um, and El Teatro Campesino and kind of when a lot of the Chicano momentum was building as kind of this kind of, I don't know, golden period of, of ch Chicanismo or algo así, pero like, um, how do you consider the idea of Chicano as it relates to you and your work and your art? Well, I am what I am. Um, I was born in a certain place. I come have a cultural history that comes with me uh, you know, my, my family were not migrant workers. Uh, they were ranchers. Um, uh, so that's a, there's a little bit different. I mean, if you look at the people out here, they, you know, they dress in wearing kind of Western hats and the Mexicanos I'm talking about, mm -hmm. while the people in California are more, are more recent immigrants. I mean, my family goes back in Texas to 1717. So that's my father's family. They were poor soldiers then, they, and they're still not aristocrats or anything like that. But they're, you know, they've been part of the fabric of, of this of this area from the time it was settled by by the Spaniards. Uh, my mother's family were, as I said, were carrancistas. So they were a little bit upper class. They had property. They had money. They had they had uh, social, you know, connections and. Uh, by Carrancista, I mean that my my grandfather's uncle was Municipal Carranza, president of Mexico. Mm. Wow! So mm. uh, that's why I mean when they had to leave the country, they had to leave the country. Wow! <laughs> so uh, uh, as I said, I had aunts who never married because they would have had to marry below their station. Mm. Um, uh, you know. I'm very proud of that heritage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the term Chicano, I, 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 I only heard for the first time when I was about 15 mm -hmm. in, the, in the playground of the school I was going to when, when one fellow said, you know, we should, well, the, the Chicano should stay together, hang around together. Mm -hmm. um, I had a little bit of problem with that because I had friends that were gringos mm -hmm. and, and have had all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also had many friends that were Mexicano, so I mean, I did. I didn't feel like I, I, I had. I was in a place to, to somehow segregate myself, and didn't want to. Uh, I'm an American by culture, mm -hmm. and not a Mexican. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I had the music, the food, the history, that's part of me, and I'm really proud of that. Uh, uh, we're part of this continuum. Uh, I'm also had my DNA done, so I know that I'm 42% Native American, mm. wow. and uh, uh, you know, and 52% European. Mm. Um, uh, that Native American part of me is just as important mm -hmm. to my heritage and to me. Uh, so I'm hearing being here in this place in San Marcos, Texas, and having the owner of this property hand me something and said, look what I found. It's an arrowhead. Hmm. But this place has been continuously inhabited for 10,000 years. Right. Um, and, when, and that's part of my blood. That's part of my DNA. Uh, I'm proud of that too. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, as a career, my father, as I said, was... Uh, went to work for civil service. He, he became, he started as a warehouseman at Kelly Field. When he retired, um, he was no longer just a seventh grade student. He had an AA from San Antonio College and he was in charge of guided missile repair for the Air Force. Mm. I mean, he was a brilliant man. He was, you know, he never, he never saw a challenge that he couldn't overcome. Mm. He always graduated at the top of any group, any class that he ever took. Um, so, uh, you know, 
that sense of strength, you know, I felt is, I was never I was never as tough as him, because mm. he would you know if anybody challenged him to a fight, he'd take them on. <laughs> and I saw him fight once. I mean, he was like a bear. He he just buried the guy with punches. Did it scare you to see your father fight? Well, I was more stunned. Stunned. Um, but I mean, again, that was part of when he was when he was came back from the war, and I felt it was part of his PTSD that uh, that that flash an anger that he that he had. Uh, he overcame that, um, and uh, it says that, and wherever he went, I, as I said, everywhere he went, people had this enormous respect for his for his integrity and his personal strength. Mm. Uh, not as a fierce person, but as a, just an individual who got things done. Mm. Um, so when I write anything, I write with this respect I have for my family, that, uh, that they were fine people, noble people, and uh, I don't want to do anything that would embarrass them or, or make them feel like that I would think that they're any less and I know that there are people out there that, that you know, have had really bad upbringings and real tough lives. But uh, I also want to celebrate all the, all the Latinos out there who, who had good lives, mm -hmm. that are successful, that have, you know, uh, that, are, that are good in their heart mm -hmm. and do good things, mm -hmm. uh, that treat art as something that is to be respected um, I feel a certain sense that when I got to Hollywood, uh, there were there were these people that I considered professional Mexicans mm. that would put on the sombrero and go out and do a Mexican hat dance and be the you know hold the hat in their hands and while they were talking to the gringos. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I found that really insulting mm. <laughs> because because what happened is that informed gringos that that's what Mexicans were like. Mm -hmm. Right. And I certainly didn't want to be cast in that, in that role. Mm -hmm. So part of me, in the sense, when I started making films, I started making films that were not Chicano or not culturally oriented. Though I didn't, I did do those things too. But I was, I can, I was considered one of the better scientific filmmakers in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, only because I felt like I, I did not want to be cast. I did not want to be, to pigeonholed. In, in a certain kind of, uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, filmmaking. Well, when we need a Mexican, we'll hire you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, well, when you need a filmmaker, you you're go. the guy we're looking for. Right, right. <laughs> Last question, sir. I know you have children. You have two. I know you told me your daughter is a dancer. Is your son an artist too? Well, my daughter is uh, uh, trained as a dancer, but she's an architect. Okay. And uh, she uh, uh, graduated from architecture school. She's also a designer, designs jewelry. And, uh, but her, her, her designs are things that are made out of gold and made out of silver and platinum. And I mean, they're, they're, they're actually works of art that happen to be jewelry, but they're sculptural. And uh, she'll, you know, as soon as my grandson is old enough, she'll probably return to architecture and, and start designing things that you want, you know, bigger things. Mm. Uh, my son is a painter, an artist, uh, lives in New York. He's quite successful. Um, uh, I get, he's really shy, but he's so goddamn talented. Uh, mm. um, you know, I'm really proud of him. Mm. And he's self, basically self-taught, even though he has a master's degree from in, in a master of fine arts in, in painting, figurative painting. Mm. Um, he taught himself. By the time he was six years old, he could draw things that look like things. I mean, mm. he could do the cartoon Calvin and Hobbes. He could do those characters, mm. you know, from his head in motion. So it's like he wasn't copying a picture and making another one like it. Mm -hmm. He was doing the character, doing stuff in motion. That uh, uh, so, I mean, and he also has had this incredible ability. If he sees a color, he can reproduce it. Wow. Uh, wow. That to me is stunning, that uh, he can look at that flower and see that, 
the shades of the pinks and the reds together and reproduce that. Wow. Uh, well, you you know the the Severo Perez is 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 going to be regarded as as a as a legendary artist, filmmaker, writer, uh, playwright, and it's just been such a pleasure, sir, to know you in this brief time here. And um, I can't wait till I run into you again. In fact, when I come out to LA next, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you up. But um, any last comments or anything else you want to say to uh, maybe young up and coming artists or want to be filmmakers? Well, mostly that don't tell yourself no, that you can't do it. If you have an ambition, and you can't con yourself. I mean, if you don't have talent, you better start recognizing it. But if you feel like you do have talent, um, I like to equate it to a, to a baseball player. You know, a guy can have great eye-hand coordination, can have, uh, you know, fantastic ability, uh, being able to throw the ball straight, uh, hit the ball hard, uh, uh, know the rules of the game. But unless you practice, you're never going to be a pro. I mean, it, it's just not going to happen that you're going to become an actor or a, or a writer or a filmmaker overnight by some accident. It only comes because you really work at it and you prepare yourself for the opportunity. And when the opportunity comes, you better be ready because it'll, you know, if the, you're not ready, it'll disappear and that door won't open again. But if you're ready, that door, when that door opens, there's all kinds of other doors that open too. So, you know, believe in yourself, you trust yourself, you want to do it, uh, you know, go for it. Uh, don't tell yourself, no, no, I can't do that. No, that's just too hard. Or that's, that's for other people. That's, you know, um, again, that was, <laughs> this is butterfly is landing on your head. It's supposed to be, supposed to think you're a flower. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's the, the thing that I, I, I find most among young people, that they assume that what I do looks easy, mm. but they don't see the years that it took for me to stand in that moment. And they don't see all the work I did last night mm. <laughs> before I stood there that moment. So it looks like, I don't know, like I'm not doing anything because, in fact, I'm in complete control of, of the world around me. Profound words from writer, director, playwright, all-around artist, teacher, friend, Severo Perez. You can find his work at scriptpostscript.com. And if you're interested in his archives, you want to do some research on his, on his work, I urge you to contact the Whitliff Galleries at Texas State University. Oh,